Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Tech Talk.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news which, as usual, has popped up the past 24 or so hours. And we're going to start things out with the fact that Zen 4 is progressing rather nicely in the design stage, and AMD are doubling down their commitment to continue to push innovation in the CPU marketplace. In July, they launched CPUs such as this. It says as the camera won't quite focus in on it. It's the Ryzen 3000, but more recently they've had a great deal of success with their Rome launch. Rome also uses the Zen 2 architecture, but is being very well received in the data center with up to 64 processor cores. This is also an article, so if you do prefer the written word, then by golly gosh, you can find it linked in the video description. A few days ago, AMD hosted the Epic Horizon event, which, as the name implies, is where they were detailing the Rome series of processors for the server market. Rome, naturally, is using Zen 2, but they did not limit the conversation to just Rome and Zen 2, but instead also used the event as an opportunity to discuss future plans for their CPUs. Basically, AMD want to solidify in their c customer's mind that, yeah, we actually have plans to continue to innovate, push new processors out to the market, and if you invest in our ecosystem, you're going to continue to be rewarded for that for generations to come. So as a quick refresher then, pardon the CPU architecture pun, AMD launched Zen back in 2017 using the 14NM process. About a year after that, we saw Zen Plus, which was only used in the Ryzen 2000 series CPUs, along with the second generation of Threadripper processors. The primary benefit to the architecture, other than a small clock frequency increase, was a reduction in latency for the caches, and this provided around a 2-3% IPC gain from the original Zen architecture to Zen Plus. We actually tested those claims and we verified them, which is definitely good. Threadripper X399 definitely got the best deal though with Zen Plus because we saw the 1950X and its 16 core uh, processor go all the way up to 32 cores for the second generation of Threadripper. Definitely a large improvement, but Epic did not receive a Zen Plus series of processors. Instead, AMD told us that we would have to wait to, uh, for Rome, which was the successor to the first generation of uh, Epic CPUs, Nepal. And of course, now we actually have Rome launched using the Zen 2 processor architecture. Zen 2 uses 7NM uh, from TSMC and increases the clock frequencies we see an improvement in IPC, uh, about 15-ish percent from the older Zen architecture, but that does, of course, depending upon the application that you're running. Heavy floating point tasks will benefit more, as well as uh, an increase in core count. For example, the 3950X, which isn't launched yet, but is upcoming, will go up to 16 cores, and Rome, meanwhile, goes up to 64 cores which is, well, bonkers, to be totally honest. During the event, Mark Papermaster was discussing, though, the next generation cores, and he said that the company can neither can't let up or won't let up with its pursuit of performance. He went on to say, and I quote, we are always working on the next designs while we are doing our current designs. If you're unfamiliar, AMD uses what's known as a leapfrogging design approach. What's that? Well, basically, AMD have multiple engineering teams that work on different projects, but they are managed by one team. So what happens is, one team, for example, would have been designing Zen 2, while another team would have been in the planning stages for Zen 3. So Zen 2's team, let's call that Team A, will share, okay, well, here's the issues we've run into with Zen 2, here's the strengths, here's the weaknesses, Here's what we suggest you can do to implement and fix them. And then naturally this will continue to evolve and evolve and evolve through the design process. So what we have now is AMD's roadmap for its processors. So Zen 2 
is currently shipping, of course. It started to ship in July with the Ryzen 3000 series. The design is now complete for Zen 3, which is utilizing the 7nm plus uh, node from TSMC. I'll get into more about that in just a moment. But Zen 4 is currently in the design phase. Mark Papermaster commented on this by telling us that we don't need to stop there. We already have our engineers working on Zen 4. He told us that it's fundamental for us to keep momentum in the industry. We have focused on showing the industry that we have a roadmap that we can deliver to enterprise and data center as promised. We know that a highly competitive environment we are in, but for us, it's quote personal and we will not let up. We will have, sorry, you will have our commitment. And he concluded. So what this basically means is that the design of Zen 3 is now finished. So the tape out can start beginning and then the testing with engineering sample processes uh, can start happening over the next months. Meanwhile, Zen 4's design is continuing. Unfortunately, we don't know a whole bunch of information with Zen 3 and what it's going to bring to the table, let alone what Zen 4 is going to bring to the table. We can tell you one thing for certain, well, other than the fact that Zen 3 is going to be using 7nm+, which AMD have publicly commented on multiple times, that actually will also be the end of the commitment AMD made with the AM4 uh, platform. In other words, they had committed to uh, have backwards compatibility up to 2020, so theoretically Zen 3 will be the, or Ryzen 4000, I suppose, will be the final processors AMD launch on the uh, AM4 platforms that we currently have. Which, when you think about it, is really impressive. It's basically four generations of CPU support. I imagine there's going to be the obvious caveats there, like potentially the latest PCIe standards won't work. Uh, I'm going to assume that we may move on to PCIe 5 at that point, but who knows? I guess it depends on the eventual release date. And we can also imagine that there are also going to be IPC improvements as well. There has been no shortage in rumours for Zen 3. SMT4 has been heavily rumoured. In fact, it was uh, plonked on Chip Wiki. And a couple of people have actually murmured about it to me on Twitter and said that that's what they've heard from folks at AMD. But at the end of the day, A, that's nowhere near a confirmation. And for B... Even if it is confirmed, which I'm not telling you it is, because these are not, like, amazing sources. These are not the same sources that told me, for example, uh, the July the 7th release date. Nowhere near that concrete, so I don't want you to misconstrue what I'm saying. But let's just for a moment say that those rumours are accurate, and i on the fence if they are, to be totally honest. Although we have seen products from Intel and many other companies that do have uh, SMT4. But let's just for the moment say that it is true. It does certainly not mean that the Ryzen series of processors will feature it. Personally, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, SMT4 is going to be reserved for the data center, and maybe not even uh, Threadripper would actually uh, have this uh, feature either. I'm guessing that they probably want to segment the product offerings a little bit. But moving to what we do know, Zen 3 does use, does use, excuse me. 7nm plus so this basically means that it will be utilizing euvl during the manufacturing process according to what tsmc have told us publicly this theoretically should improve yields and also provide better area scaling uh, 15 to 20 percent is what tsmc have said but you have to remember that that is with a simpler device that is not the uh, Zen free processor architecture, so it could be a little worse than that. But let's just but let's just take that number, because obviously that's the publicly available one. And as for performance, it's said to be about ten percent better for the same power consumption compared to the standard vanilla seven nm processors used in the uh, Ryzen three thousand slash Zen uh, two architecture. If you're going to take anything from this video. Then it be that AMD are doubling down on their commitment. They're not going to be slowing down. They're going to continue to push new processor architectures. From the wording we're seeing here, we most likely will not see another Zone Plus. They will continue to push the IPC targets, the clock frequency targets, because they know that if they don't, Intel will be biting on their heels in the not-too-distant future.
Next up, we have AMD 7341:00, aka GFX 1012, aka Narve 14. And that's right, we have yet another leaked benchmark for AMD's upcoming what looks to be lower end SKUs in the RDNA lineup. So for the sake of this video, I'm just going to call it the RX 5600, but for all we know, it could be known as Paddington Bear when they actually finally launch it. The specifications of this, despite it being a later entry, are very much what we've seen in the past. So it does actually still contain, you guessed it, 24 compute units with a clock frequency of 1900 MHz. If you are looking at the CL underscore device underscore max underscore compute underscore unit and spotting 12 rather than 24, I just want to quickly remind you that uh, CompuBench actually recognizes half the number of compute units with the RDNA architecture. So basically you just take 12 and multiply it by 2, which when you do the complicated maths on that equals, of course, 24. I've also decided to do a quick comparison against the RX 5700 XT, although obviously performance can change because this is potentially not final silicon, and also not all of the benchmarks were running, but it does give us at least some indicator of the performance of this GPU. And against the RX 5700 XT, uh, which typically scores around the 12,500, uh, for the level set segmentation 128, this scores just over 5,000 points, which is just about what you'd expect considering it has so many fewer compute units. So basically the scaling for this is about accurate. And now we're going to move over to the RX 5700 and 5700 XT, specifically on rumours that the graphics cards, at least the standard reference design, are going to be going end of line. This was actually uh, originally covered by the website Cal Cutland, which is French if memory serves, and basically they had cited sources that told them that AMD would be discontinuing the uh, standard reference model and instead push towards the IIB custom variants. Well, AMD's Scott Herkelman has actually denied that publicly, and in addition to that, AMD have also spoken to Tom's Hardware. The representative speaking to Tom said, and I quote, We expect there will continue to be a strong supply of Radeon RX 5700 series graphics cards in the market, with multiple uh, designs starting to arrive from our IIB partners, as is standard practice, just to be clear here, standard practice by AMD. Once the inventory of AMD reference cards has been sold, AMD will continue to support new partner designs with Radeon RX 5700 series reference design kits. In addition to that, Scott Herkelman on Twitter said, and I quote, We will continue to offer Radeon RX 5700 series uh, reference designs on AMD.com and select OEM retail and e-tailers. However, we are fully transitioning our AIB partners over to the new custom designs. So what does that mean? Because that might be a bit confusing to some people. Well, in a nutshell, the designs aren't going end of line exactly, but what AMD are essentially doing is shifting the focus to the custom designs. Now, I actually think that's a smart move by AMD. It's actually kind of their modus operandi very frequently. Uh, if you go back to other launches like the R9 290X, for example, they did very similar. Basically, there is one reason that a lot of people uh, will buy the reference to well, I guess technically there's two reasons. One is typically those cards are a little cheaper because obviously the cooler isn't so robust. And two, if you're planning to put the cards under water, for example, then that can be another reason to do it because ultimately what difference does it make with the cooler if all you're going to do is rip it off anyway and throw it in the trash, pretty much. So what AMD are doing here is... Still providing the reference design through their own website, and technically some uh, some AIBs will be selling the reference design, but it's not going to be the focus of the company, and I suspect many of them will want to really push and promote their AIB models. This has been a very AMD 
uh, news heavy couple of days but uh, before I finish this video, I did want to discuss one last thing. It's an update, actually, to Resident Evil. A few days ago, uh, by the way, if uh, you're not a regular viewer, if you've just tuned in, Resident Evil is easily one of my favourite video game series of all time. Uh, so, we actually heard a while ago that Resident Evil ambassadors in Japan were being issued an invite where they could test out an unannounced Resident Evil game. Well... It's not just limited to Japan. Actually, a very similar email is now being sent over to US members of the Ambassador Program. And the email is very ambiguous. It doesn't tell you much. It just essentially says that you can try out a, quote, new game in early development. The tests are being carried out in Los Angeles on the September the 20th and also the 21st. And in New York... You have the 23rd and the 24th as the dates that are available. There are no details other than that in terms of what title you're going to be testing. And furthermore, they are only allowing a few applicants to try uh, these, th this game, whatever it is. You will not be compensated for your time. And if you're thinking that uh, Capcom are going to cough up for your hotel costs, well, no. So it's great news if, for example, you happen to live in the New York area. But if you don't, then, well, that's all you to cover those costs. So there's a few options. Resident Evil 8 is certainly one of them, or a remake. Capcom have basically confirmed Resident Evil 3 is one of the remakes, but they have also insinuated that they would like to also explore other remakes for other games. Personally, I would really love for a remaster of some description you know, a decent remaster, let me just, you know, stress that, for Resident Evil Code Veronica, which was actually probably my second or third favourite Resident Evil ever. Uh, another possibility, obviously, is that it could be some spin-off, perhaps either designed specifically for the Switch or whatever other console. So it's going to be really interesting to see what uh, Capcom actually announced here. I would not be surprised if this title is specifically designed for the next generation systems, Maybe we may also see a port for the current generation consoles, but given the fact that they're saying it's early in development, even if you say it's another 18 to 24 months, by that point the next generation consoles will be on the shelves. So maybe, and this is speculation on my part, maybe what Capcom are doing is to get the game ready for either the launch of the next generation consoles or at least within the you know first six months. I believe, actually, speaking of Code Veronica, uh, Capcom actually did the same with the Dreamcast version, although later on it was ported to other systems such as the GameCube and, of course, the PS2. Anyway, I think that's just about it for today's video. Hopefully, you've enjoyed it. If you did, then consider dropping a like on the video and also subscribing to the channel if you've not already done so. And also clicking the bell icon because, well, we know what subscriptions and YouTube is like. And you can also find us linked on social media in the description down below. So if you want to follow us on that, then feel free to do so. But I'm going to wish you an amazing day. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.